doing the impossible. Hello everyone. I like the stories Eric Little. Please listen something greater than gold. Crack. The sound of the starter's pistol echoed around Columns Stadium. The final of the 400 meters had begun. Eric Little lunged forward. The spikes on his black leather running shoes gripped the rolled cinder surface of the track. Puffs of gray cinders burst from under his shoes with each stride. Eric was running in the outside lane, the worst to be in. Running next to him was the American, Horatio Fitch, the favorite to win the gold medal. Fitch had set a new world record for the distance in his heat to qualify for the final. Running next to Fitch was Joseph Mbach the Swiss runner who had also broken the world record in his qualifying heat. Everyone expected the battle for the gold medal to be between these two men. The cheers of the crowd rose in anticipation. As the field of runners streaked down the back straight away from the starting line, though, it was Eric Little in the lead. As the runners rounded the corner and passed the 200-meter mark, the midway point of the race, Eric had run the first half of the race in the amazingly fast time of 22.2 seconds. Eric could hear the feet of the other runners stomping against the cinder track as the men strained to catch up to him. The crowd could see that Guy Butler, the other British runner in the race, was three meters behind Eric. Horatio Fitch was also gaining fast, but with no time to look back, Eric threw all his effort into running. As the crowd realized that Eric Little was not falling back into third or fourth place as expected, it became strangely silent, too stunned to cheer. Those who knew anything about running techniques just shook their heads. A runner couldn't sprint for the whole 400 meters of the race. To them it was obvious, Eric Little was a 100 meter runner who had no idea how to run a 400 meter race. A runner who sprints from the start in such a race, as though he's running in a 100-meter dash, will use up all his energy and have no stamina for a final burst of speed at the end of the race. The crowd waited silently for Eric to fade. By the time Eric had rounded the bend, Horatio Fitch had closed to within two meters of taking the lead. Eric could sense his presence. Believing that Fitch was making his move on Eric, the crowd burst to life again. Just as everyone thought that Horatio Fitch was about to pass Eric, a gasp went through the crowd. It couldn't be. It was impossible. No one had ever run the 400 meters like this before. But it was true. Just when the crowd was sure that he was fading, Eric threw back his head and flung his arms about like a drowning man. With that, he mustered a burst of speed and pulled away from Horatio Fitch. Instead of slowing down, Eric was running the second zoned half of the race faster than the first. Sensing an upset, the crowd erupted into cheers for Eric. Many frantically waved him on with Union Jacks. As he reached the end of the home straight, Eric threw himself forward across the finish line five meters ahead of Horatio Fitch. He took several more steps to slow down and then collapsed into the arms of the British coach. Eric sucked air into his lungs as fast and as hard as he could as he lay on his back on the track. Thundering applause erupted throughout the stadium. The noise was deafening. It was reported later that it could be heard all over Paris. Eric Little had done the impossible, and the crowd had watched him do it. Now the people wanted to raise their voices and celebrate the win with him. Finally, after several minutes, the noise died down enough to hear the official announcement that Eric not only had won the race, but also had set a new world record. Eric Little had broken the old record by two tenths of a second. The crowd went wild again. Some of the members of the British Olympic team made their way onto the field and hoisted Eric onto their shoulders. They carried him along the track until they were in front of the official box where the Prince of Wales, the future King of England, stood cheering. The prince acknowledged Eric, who in turn bowed his head to him as a mark of respect. All around Eric, people were cheering, waving Union Jacks, shaking Eric's hand, and patting the runner on the back. Emotions surged inside Eric's exhausted body. Eric felt proud and happy all at once. 
He smiled to himself in satisfaction and marveled at how different the scene was from anything he'd ever dreamed of as a small boy growing up on the coastal plain of northern China. Going home. Four-year-old Eric Little had a wonderful life. He lived at a large London Missionary Society compound in Saocheng on the Great Plain of North China. Along with his six-year-old brother Robert and Jenny, his three-year-old sister, Eric had free run of the place. There were four large houses inside the compound walls, plus two schools, one for boys and one for girls, and a church. Eric's father, James Little, preached in the church, and his mother, Mary, helped teach school. As a nurse, Eric's mother also took care of many of the local children when they were sick. Sometimes visitors to the Saochang compound thought little Eric was a Chinese boy. Eric dressed in a blue padded jacket and pants like the rest of the village children, and he chatted away to his friends in perfect Chinese. But when he took his cap off, it was obvious he wasn't Chinese. Despite his local dress, he had straight blonde hair and big blue eyes. The lady has fair Scottish coloring, his mother would tell visitors as she patted Eric on the head and sent him back outside to play with his friends or his pet goat. Eric often heard his parents talk about the hills of Bonnie Scotland, and he tried to imagine what the country would be like. His mother said it never got too cold or too hot in Scotland, unlike China, where it fell below freezing in winter and soared to 110 degrees Fahrenheit in summer. She also told Eric of huge areas there, as far as a person could see, with not a house or farm in sight. Eric found this hard to believe, especially when he clambered up on top of the six-foot-high mud wall that surrounded the Mission compound. The Great Plain of North China surrounded Saochang, and across the plain lived 10 million people and 10,000 villages dotted close together. Stretched between the villages was an almost endless patchwork of wheat and millet fields divided by snaking muddy streams and waterways that had been used for centuries to irrigate the land. Eric couldn't look anywhere around this landscape and not see people, houses, and farms. It was the only landscape he had known in his young life, and it was very hard for him to imagine anything else. Eric's parents had come to China before Eric was born. James Little arrived in China as a missionary. In 1898, and soon afterwards, his fiancée, Mary, joined him there. The two were married in Shanghai in 1899 and then sent by the London Missionary Society LMS to work in Mongolia. Soon after arriving in Mongolia, though, a terrible rebellion broke out in China. A group of men calling themselves the League of Righteous and Harmonious Fists, or boxers, for short, stirred up hatred among the Chinese people toward all foreigners. The boxers believed that they possessed magical powers. They thought that their bodies could stop bullets and cannonballs and that they could ward off sword blows with their bare arms. Many of the uneducated peasants in China believed the boxers and were terrified of them. The Boxer Rebellion erupted in June 1900. Chinese people were encouraged to rise up and kill all the foreigners who had humiliated their country for so long. The boxers especially wanted foreign missionaries killed because they were bringing another religion to the people of China. Many people did join with the boxers and killed missionaries, along with many Chinese Christians. The boxer rebellion started when the German ambassador to Peking was assassinated. By the time it was finally put down by a combined force of 20,000 foreign troops, 200 missionaries, including women and children, and over 30,000 Chinese Christians had been killed. Mongolia was one of the first places the boxers attacked. James Little had fled the mission station. There with Mary, who was expecting their first child. The couple had left all their belongings behind except for a small suitcase of clothes, in fear for their lives at every turn, they made the long and tortuous journey south several hundred miles to Shanghai. There they waited at the LMS compound before moving on to Tientsin. While waiting for the rebellion to die down, James Little traveled back to Mongolia to see what had become of the mission and the Chinese Christians he had been forced to leave behind. 
he found the mission station destroyed and the local Christians in hitting. The area still wasn't safe for missionaries to return to. When James Little reported his findings to the London Missionary Society, the society sent the Littles to one of its established mission centers in Sao Chang, a small village in the central area of the Great Plain. By then, the couple had two sons. On January 16, 1902, 18 months after the birth of her first son, Robert, Mary Little had given birth to a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, dimple-chinned baby boy. The baby had been named Eric Henry Little. The baby was to have been called Henry Eric Little until a missionary friend pointed out that the initials spelled H-E-L. James Little quickly switched his new son's first names around. Even though the Boxer Rebellion had been put down, in many parts of China feelings of hatred and anger towards foreigners still simmered below the surface. This was not the case in Sao Chang. However, the Chinese Christians who lived there were eager to welcome missionaries back. When Eric's parents arrived at the compound for the first time, a banner was hanging over the village gate. It read Chung Wai Chai, which James and Mary Little knew men Chinese and foreigners, all one home. How glad the Littles were to finally be somewhere safe. 44 After James and Mary Little had been in China for nine years, the London Missionary Society decided the family should return to Scotland for a year's break, or furlough, as it was officially called. We're going home, Robert yelled as he raced out the door into the courtyard where Eric and Jenny were playing with a new batch of kittens. Home? Questioned five-year-old Eric. We are home. No, our other home, silly, to Scotland, replied his older and wiser brother, who had never actually been there. That afternoon, the little family began to pack and prepare for their trip home. Several days later, the family made their way from Sao Chang to Tientsin, where they caught a boat to Shanghai. Eric had been with his family to the beach before, but he had never been on a boat. He stood in amazement and peered over the side until Tientsin disappeared completely from view. In Shanghai, they boarded a German steamer for the six-week voyage from Shanghai to Southampton. After arriving in England, the family caught a train to London where James and Mary Little met with the leaders of the London Missionary Society and gave them a detailed report of their work. Then they climbed aboard another train for the final leg of the trip home to Scotland. As the train rolled into Scotland, Eric's eyes grew big as he looked out the window. There was so much empty land. Sheep grazed among castle ruins, and the wide green valleys were dotted with small stone cottages, everything delighted Eric. Scotland was so different from China, and so different from anything he had imagined. Finally, the train drew to a stop at the village of Dreamin on the shores of Loch Lomond. James Little announced to his young son that they were finally Eric loved Dreamin. His parents rented a house there, and he was able to explore the same places his father had explored as a child. Eric's grandfather owned a small grocery store in Dreamin. It didn't take Eric long to figure out that he liked the aniseed balls, licorice all sorts, and English toffees sold in the store. Grandfather Little also ran a side business transporting people and packages to and from the railway station. The village and the station were about a mile apart. Many times Eric would perch on top of the horse-drawn wagon with his grandfather, looking importantly down on the world as they rode to the station to meet the train. The year-long furlough and dream and sped by, and at the end of it, Eric's mother had something important to tell her sons. The two boys would not be returning to China with the rest of the family. It was time for them to start their formal education in a proper English school. In 1908, it was normal for the children of missionaries to attend boarding schools in England while their parents served overseas in foreign countries. Six-year-old Eric clung to his brother as the two boys followed their mother up the steps and into the dreary stone administration building of London School for the Sons of Missionaries. In 1912, while Eric and Robert were still enrolled there, the school changed its name to Eltham College. The school had been started in 1842 by the London Missionary Society, 
and all of the 150 boys who attended it were sons of missionaries, just as the sign on the gate said. All going well, Robert and Eric would attend the school until they graduated and were ready for university. An hour after arriving, the boys had been outfitted with gray flannel shorts, jacket, tie, and cap, just like all the other students. Then they were shown to their beds at the end of a long row of narrow cots that ran the length of the upstairs dorm room. Beside each cot was a washstand that held a basin and water jug. The brothers were told to hang their things on the hook beside their cots and join the rest of the class for a cricket lesson on the backfield. Mary Little slipped quietly away from the school while her boys were being introduced to the meaning of a wicket, a maiden over, and other details of cricket. It would be seven years before Eric and Robert Little would see their parents and sister Jenny again. After his carefree life in China and the wilds of the Scottish Highlands, Eric found it difficult to adjust to living in the grey stone building in London. He missed his parents, his younger sister Jenny, and the goats and the kittens he'd had in China. Since he was small for his age and very shy, Eric let Robert do the talking for them both. He would freeze with terror if someone asked him a question when Robert wasn't around. Edit at school, every part of Eric and Robert's life, along with the lives of the other students, was organized by someone else. The students sat in long rows when eating their meals, with a schoolmaster looking on to make sure they used proper manners. The little brothers missed Chinese food a lot. They were not used to eating the bread and dripping in bowl of grey oatmeal they were served each morning for breakfast. Eric longed for a bowl of soya beans or millet. All of the boys in school marched into class in rows and sat without talking as their teacher read the day's lessons. After school they all went to the study hall, where they did their homework, once again sitting in rows. Each Thursday evening they wrote letters to their parents under the supervision of one of the schoolmasters. All this work was hard for a young boy not used to attending school. As with most schools in the early 1900s, the hours of hard study went hand in hand with a lot of vigorous exercise. Sports were not something extra a boy might do for a hobby. They were a serious part of the school day. All the boys learned to play rugby in winter. In summer they played cricket and competed in many track and field events. This emphasis on sports was meant to teach British boys how to play by rules, how to respect authority, and how to be part of a team. While Eric didn't find much joy in class work, he enjoyed sports. In one of his letters to the family in China, 10-year-old Eric wrote, I don't think much of lessons, but I can run, and so he could both Eric and Robert excelled at every sport they tried. Another activity all the students were expected to be a part of was the school play. The drama teacher took great pride in presenting a play each year, and there was a lot of competition for the leading roles. Even the girls' parts were all played by the boys. One it was decided that the play would be Alice here in Wonderland. Eric didn't want a leading role. In fact, he didn't want a role at all. It was agony for him to think of getting up in front of so many people. As it turned out, the drama teacher cast him as the Dormouse, a shy little creature with hardly a word to say. The part was just right for Eric, who did a wonderful job. Eric didn't even have to pretend to be shy. After the play and until the time he left Eltham College at 19, his nickname was the Mouse. For summer holidays, the two boys would take the train to Dream and to stay with their grandfather. On shorter holidays, they either stayed at school or stayed with some of their friends. Eric would have liked to have been more involved in things at school, but he was just too shy. Once there was a tennis match against a nearby girls' school, but Eric pulled out at the last minute. He couldn't imagine what he would say to a girl when he got to her school. There were also Bible studies the boys could attend if they chose. Eric liked to go along, but he always sat near the back so that he could make a quick exit if he were called upon to answer a question or make a comment. The years at school rolled by, with each new year not much different from the one before. That is, until 1914, 
when Eric was 12 years old. Two events happened that Eric would remember for the rest of his life. The first event was a happy one. Eric's mother gave birth to another baby boy, Ernest. Eric was eager to see his new little brother, and his mother promised to bring Ernest and Jenny to London for a few weeks' visit in 1915. The second Zond event was a terrible and frightening one. A great war, which would eventually be known as the First World War, started in Europe. Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire were on one side, with France, Great Britain, and Russia on the other. Many of the senior boys at the school volunteered to fight for the British. Before they left for the battlefield, they proudly visited Eltham College in their new khaki uniforms, and each boy carried a modern short magazine Lee Enfield rifle. Within weeks, many of these new recruits had been killed on the battlefields of Flanders, in France. Like the rest of the boys at school, Eric came to dread the daily assembly where the latest list of dead and injured old boys was read. It was not easy to listen to the names being read. These dead and wounded soldiers were not just names, they were people friends the boys had played cricket and rugby with, friends who had helped the younger boys in study hall. It was like losing one big brother after another, and it went on for four years. Sports, though, seemed to cheer Eric up. Like his older brother, Eric showed a lot of promise. By the time Robert had reached his senior year at Eltham College, Eric was his only real competition in sports. By 1918, when Eric was 16 and Robert was 18, the brothers were the two athletic stars of the school. The 1918 sports page in the school record book read as follows, first in cross country, high jump, and hurdling, Robert Little. First thing long jump, 100 yard dash, and quarter mile race, Eric Little. Where the one brother came in first, the other was always in second place. Not only that, Eric and Robert both played rugby for the first 15 and cricket for the first 11, the school's top teams in each sport. Robert, and then Eric, was also made captain of most of the school's sports teams. In 1918, just as Robert was old enough to consider signing up to fight, the First World War ended. That year, instead of going off to war, Robert left Eltham College for Edinburgh University to study to become a doctor. Edinburgh was located on the east coast of Scotland. For the first time in his life, Eric was alone, away from every member of his family. But he had little time to be lonely. He had to study for some difficult and important exams coming up at the end of the 1919 school year. And, as usual, involvement in sports also kept him busy. Eric did well in both pursuits. He passed his exams and set a new school record of 10.2 seconds for the 100-yard sprint, a school record that to this day has not been broken. A year later, Eric left Eltham College and rode the train north to Edinburgh University. It was a very exciting time for him. His mother was coming home to Scotland, along with 17-year-old Jenny and 6-year-old Ernest. They would all live together again in Edinburgh, and Eric's father would join them there a year later. Finally, the whole family would be together again. Sure enough, in 1921 James Little returned to Scotland. It had been six years since Eric had seen his father. After the two of them had caught up on each other's lives, James Little asked his son what he wanted to do once he finished studying for his degree in math and science. Eric had to confess that he wasn't too sure. Never in his wildest dreams, though, could he have imagined that before he even graduated he would be the most famous man in Scotland. A Rising Sports Star Eric loved attending university. He was free to come and go as he pleased, and at the end of each day, he had a home-cooked meal waiting for him to eat with his family. He kept busy with classwork and got good grades, especially in chemistry and mathematics. When he wanted a break from studying, he would get together with a group of friends and play a friendly game of rugby or throw a cricket ball around for an hour or two. It wasn't long before these friends began to notice that Eric was a very fast runner. One friend, 
Bill Harvey, who had done some running himself, invited Eric to participate in the university athletic sports competition. At first Eric refused. He was at university to get an education, not to spend his time running around a track. But Bill Harvey wanted someone to practice his coaching skills on, and in the end he managed races. Even though he had agreed to participate in the to persuade Eric to enter the 100-yard and 220-yard competition, Eric had no intention of letting running interfere with his other activities. He and four other students had made plans to take a six-day bike ride from Edinburgh to Ben Nevis and back during their Easter break. Ben Nevis was Scotland's highest mountain, and Eric wanted to climb it and see the view from the top. But Bill Harvey didn't want him to go on the trip. It was only six weeks until the competition, and he had read that bike riding stretched the wrong muscles for running. Eric didn't believe him, and he cycled off. A week later, upon returning from the trip, Eric discovered that Bill Harvey had been right. When he tried to run, his leg muscles stiffened up, and he knew it was going to be a tough job to get back in shape for the race. The five weeks leading up to the competition were busy. Bill Harvey took coaching seriously and spent many hours with Eric, massaging his leg muscles to make them stretch the right way again. As race day approached, Eric began to get nervous. It was one thing to run at Eltham College, where everyone knew him and where his own brother was the main competition. It was another thing to run in front of a thousand strangers. Finally, in May 1921, the day of the competition rolled around. Bill Harvey had worked hard to get Eric's body in shape for his first competition in Scotland. Of course, Eric didn't think he could win his races. Scotland's best running star, Inna Stewart, was competing against him in both events. Eric did hope, however, to be among the first three runners to finish the race. Eric Little and Inna Stewart were set to race against each other in the first heat of the 100-yard sprint. Eric jogged nervously to the starting line. It was a hot day, and he wiped his brow on his white singlet before crouching at the starting line beside the other runners in the heat. The starter's pistol let out a loud crack, and the runners sprang forward. The crowd cheered wildly for Inna Stewart, and in less than 11 seconds it was over. As expected, Inna Stewart had finished first, but right on his heels was Eric Little. The final of the race was held later that afternoon. The race played out much as the heat had in the morning, but with just one difference. This time, it was Eric Little who burst through the finish tape to win the race and Inna Stewart who was close behind. Eric had won the 100-yard dash. The crowd roared its approval. The next day it was time for the 220-yard dash, in a Stewart specialty race. Innes was sure that no one in Scotland could beat him, and he was right. Eric came in second, losing by exactly one inch. The crowd went wild with excitement, as though it knew it was seeing not one but two of Scotland's greatest future athletes. Eric stood proudly on the podium as he received his prize. He was thrilled to have a first and a second place in the two races. As the crowd clapped and cheered, it didn't know it then, but it had just seen something on Scottish soil again, Eric Little coming in second in a race. From that time on, Eric won every single race he ever entered in Scotland. Eric expected everything to return to normal after his win. Things always had after he'd won a race at Eltham College. However, as he soon found out, things were a little different at university. As of May 1921, Eric Little was the top 100-yard sprinter and the second fastest 220-yard runner in the whole university. This meant that he was Edinburgh University's best hope for a medal at the Scottish University Sports Competition in two months. As such, he had a duty to run for his university. While he worried about his studies suffering, Eric knew he had no choice. He had to compete. Besides, he was enjoying running. The University Athletics Club decided that Bill Harvey wasn't experienced enough as a coach for its top runner. Bill was replaced by Tom McCurchar, 
a good coach with a lot of experience. Tom McCurchar took Eric to Powderhill Stadium, where he trained several other top Scottish athletes. The first time Eric walked into the stadium, he nearly walked right back out again. A group of experienced runners were training, and they looked completely silly to Eric. To warm up, they were running in place on tiptoe, like oversized ballerinas, waving their arms, wildly and rolling their shoulders at the same time. Eric told himself there was no way he was ever going to do that in front of a crowd. Tom McCurchar had agreed to coach Eric because of his win at the university competition, but as he studied Eric's terrible running style more closely, he wondered how Eric had managed to win at all. Eric had been told many times that his running style was odd. He would fling his head back and pull his arms forward almost as if he were boxing at some invisible target. He lost count of how many times Tom McCurchar tried to make him run looking straight ahead with his arms gliding smoothly at his sides. But no matter how hard he tried, Eric simply couldn't change. However, Tom McCurchar did succeed in getting Eric to do the ballerina warm-up, and before long, Eric was prancing around on tiptoe before a race, like everyone else. The Scottish University sports competition quickly rolled around. Tom McCurchar was pleased with Eric's speed, if not his style. Eric won the 100-yard sprint, with Inna Stewart coming in second. Their one-two finishes helped Edinburgh University earn the proud honour of having the best athletics team in Scotland. In two track and field competitions, Eric Little had proved himself to be a top athlete, and the more he ran, the more he won. Time after time he broke records. He ran the 100-yard dash in 10.2 seconds on and the 220 in 21.8 seconds, a full two-tenths of a second better than the previous record. He also ran the 440-yard quarter-mile race in 52.6 seconds, so much faster than it had ever been run before at the Scottish Inter-University Games that it took another 35 years before anyone bettered it. Before long, Eric had a group of supporters who travelled from place to place to watch him run. He found this embarrassing at first, but he also thought it was a nice gesture for so many people to give up their free time to come and encourage him. As impressed as these supporters were with Eric's speed, they were more impressed with his attitude. Although he wanted to win each race and trained hard to do so, he always had a good attitude towards the other competitors. Before a race he would shake each contestant's hand and wish him success. He never said good luck, because he didn't believe luck had much to do with winning a race. For him, it was skill and training that won races. Other gestures also showed his good sportsmanship. Back then, at the beginning of a race, a runner would dig himself two small holes in the turf or cheater track just behind the starting line. Into these holes, the runner would place his toes to push off and get a better start. Eric used a small steel trowel for this purpose, and when he'd finished digging his holes, he would always offer the trowel to the other runners to use. On one occasion, another runner from Edinburgh University had drawn the outside lane in the 440-yard race. The 440-yard race was one lap around the track, and runners hated to be in the outside lane for it. There were few markings on the track, and the person running in the outside lane was Eric quietly swapped lanes with the other runner. The change in lane made no difference to him. He still won. With each victor came a prize, and soon the little family was facing a problem it had never encountered before, keeping valuable items in the house. It didn't take long before the Littles' house on Gillespie Crescent in Edinburgh was brimming with Eric's prizes and trophies. There were the usual gold and silver cups and bowls, along with cake stands, clocks, leather suitcases, vases, enough watches for everyone in the family to have three apiece, cases of cutlery, pens, solid bowls, and silver tea sets. With so much gold and silver in the house, Eric's mother worried that the house would be burglarized. She hid many of the most valuable prizes under her bed each night. But the house was never broken into, and Eric just kept collecting prizes each time he ran. 
running wasn't the only thing Eric excelled at. Because of his speed, he won a place on the Edinburgh University rugby team. From his earliest days at Eltham College, he'd enjoyed playing rugby. His position was on the wing. A rugby team consists of 15 players, 8 forwards and 7 backs. After the ball is freed from a ruck or scrum by the 8 forwards using their feet, it is picked up by the halfback and passed along the line of backs. At the end of the back line are the wings, one on the left side of the field and one on the right. When the wing finally receives the ball, it is his job to try to get himself and the ball as far up the field towards the goal line as possible. All the while, the opposing team is looking to tackle whoever has the ball. With his speed, the position on the wing was tailor-made for Eric. When he got the ball, he seemed able to make incredible plays and gain valuable field position for his side. In his second year at Edinburgh, the university rugby team toured England, winning six of its seven games. Because of Eric's outstanding play in these games, the selectors for the Scottish national rugby team named Eric to their side. Rugby was and still is a matter of great national pride to the people of the British Isles. Fierce competition exists between the Scottish, Welsh, Irish, and English teams. In 1922, Scotland played Wales at Arms Park in Cardiff, Wales. The Scots had not won a match against the Welsh since 1890. Eric and the other Scottish wing, Leslie Gracie, were the stars of the game. They played a masterful game of rugby, and when the final whistle sounded, Scotland had beaten Wales 11 points to 8. Amazingly, when the game was over, the losing Welsh team scooped Eric Little and Leslie Gracie onto their shoulders and paraded them around the park. Everyone, even the losing team, it seemed, appreciated the skill of the two Scottish wings. In the grandstand, both the Welsh and the Scottish fans cheered. Between running and rugby, Eric was very busy. It would have been easy for him to let his studies slide, but somehow he managed to do everything. He even managed to be in the top three students in his classes. In 1922, after one year at home, Eric's parents' furlough came to an end, and Eric's parents returned to China with Jenny and Ernest. It was a difficult time for Eric and Robert. They had both become used to being part of a normal family, and it was hard for them to leave that behind and move into a hostel. Eric comforted himself with the fact that Robert would still be around for another year before he graduated as a doctor and returned to China. Eric laughed at one piece of advice his departing mother gave him. Even though he was only 20 years old, his fine blonde hair was beginning to recede, and his mother feared that his forehead would soon meet up with the small balding patch on the back of his head. No one else in the family had gone bald that down to taking too many hot showers after athletics meetings and rugby games. Eric wondered what his mother thought he should do after playing rugby on a muddy field for an hour and a half. Not only was Eric the only blonde and balding member of his family, he was also the only one who didn't like to talk about his faith. Even his parents weren't sure what he thought about Christianity. He kept the whole matter to himself. He always went to church on Sunday, read his Bible, and lived a good life, but for some reason, he didn't feel comfortable talking to others about God. On the other hand, Robert was a very enthusiastic Christian. Not long after their parents had left for China, an evangelistic campaign was organized for all of Scotland and Robert eagerly signed up to be a part of it. The purpose of the evangelistic campaign was to use university and high school students to share the gospel message with people all across Scotland. During their weekends and vacations, students would sleep in local churches and spend their days looking for people to invite to their nightly meetings. Many of these meetings were very successful, especially in the rural areas. The large cities, though, were much tougher. Working-class men just weren't interested in what a group of university students had to say. They were perfectly happy with their drinking, brawling, and gambling. No matter what they tried, the students couldn't seem to come up with an effective way to get their message across to these working-class people. 
a group of students from the University of Glasgow moved into a church in the industrial town of Armadale, halfway between Glasgow and Edinburgh, to share the gospel message there. They, too, soon found themselves wrestling with the problem of getting their message across to working-class people. One member of this group was David Thompson, or DP, as he was known to most people. As DP thought about the problem, he had an inspiration. Like so many men in Scotland, the men of Armadale loved rugby. So DP thought that the students should challenge the local men to a game of rugby. Everyone agreed it was a good idea, and a date was set for the match. Many local men showed up for the game, and they played hard. In the end, the students narrowly won. It was a victory in other ways, too. The students made friends with a few of the men who had played in or watched the rugby game and invited them to their meetings. DP was pleased with the success of his idea on one hand and frustrated by it on the other. Rugby was obviously a big draw for these men, but the students couldn't play games everywhere they went. A game took too long to organize, and some of the students had been hurt while playing. Yet DP felt that rugby was an important key in getting to know the local men. Then inspiration hit him again. He had been on several evangelistic campaign trips with Robert Little, and the two men had become friends. DP knew that Robert was a keen Christian and that his younger brother was none other than Eric Little, the great Scottish rugby star. If DP could persuade Robert to get Eric to speak to the men of Armadale, hundreds would turn out to hear such a famous person. The more DP thought about the idea, the more excited he became. There was just one problem. He had never heard Robert say anything about Eric's being a Christian. Still, when DP told the other students about his idea, they, too, were enthusiastic about it. If Eric Little was a Christian and would come and speak, they were sure the town hall would be filled with men. First thing the next morning, DP hitched a ride to Edinburgh. He made his way to the hostel where the Little brothers were living. Robert met him at the door, and DP lost no time in telling him why he had come. Robert gave Pa a funny look. You will ask him for us, won't you? DP asked Robert. Robert shrugged his shoulders. I think you'd better ask him yourself. He's out on a run right now, but he should be back soon. As they waited for Eric to return, DP and Robert talked about how the evangelistic campaign was progressing across Scotland. After about 20 minutes, the door finally swung open and Eric strolled in. As soon as he saw a stranger sitting with Robert, he stopped and introduced himself. Hello, I'm Eric Little, he said. DP was speechless for a moment. Then his words came in a rush. Hello, I'm David Thompson, DP for short. I'm a friend of Robert. Actually we have been on several evangelistic campaigns together. Eric nodded as he pulled up a chair. He'd heard. His brother talk about DP. Nervously, DP spilled out his plan to Eric. When he was finished, Eric sat silently. He put his face in his hands and sighed deeply. DP began to look nervous as if he had said something that was better left unsaid. After what seemed like an eternity, Eric finally looked up. All right, he said. I'll do it. Tell me where you need me and when. Like a hinge swinging a huge door open, that simple statement forever changed the course of Eric's life. His private life was about to become very public. Something even more important. On April 6, 1923, Robert Little introduced his younger brother to 80 men who had gathered in the Armadale Town Hall. The men cheered as Eric stood up to speak. Eric shifted nervously from foot to foot. He hated being the center of attention. For a moment he just stood and said nothing. Then he took a deep breath and began. He didn't speak the way a preacher did from the pulpit or a teacher in a schoolroom. Instead he spoke quietly, as if chatting with a good friend. 
He spoke about how God was in control of his life and how he accepted whatever happened to him as God's best for that time. He also spoke about how much he knew God loved him and everyone sitting there in the town hall. Then he thanked them for listening and sat down. To Eric's surprise, the next day every newspaper in Scotland carried a photo of him and a report on his talk in Armadale. The man who disliked draw. Ing attention to himself was now more famous than ever. Once Eric had given his first Christian speech, churches and groups everywhere began asking him to come and speak. The next week Eric found himself at another town hall, this one in Rutherglen on the outskirts of Glasgow. This time, 600 men showed up to hear him. Eric gave them the same simple message he had presented in Armadale, told in the same simple way. As he stood in front of the crowd in Rutherglen, Eric realized that he had been given a gift, the gift of fame, and that he could use it to share the gospel message with thousands of people. From that moment on, he was never again shy about standing in front of a crowd to speak. Indeed, he tried to accept every speaking invitation he got. If Eric thought his life was busy before, it was hectic now. During the week he attended lectures and studied for his degree. On the weekends he would go to a track meet and arrange to speak at meetings on the way there and back. Some sports writers began writing that Eric Little was trying to do too much and that would suffer. But a person had only to look at the races Eric was running in Scotland to see that that wasn't true. In fact, it seemed just the opposite. The more time Eric gave to speaking, the faster he ran. When asked how he ran so fast, he often told P.O.L. Race and then asked God to help him run even pull that he ran as fast as he could for the first half or faster for the second half. Somewhere in the mind of every school boy or school girl who has ever won a race is the tiny dream that one day he or she might win an Olympic medal. Eric had had this dream for a long time. So when the trials for the British team to attend the 1924 Olympic Games were announced, he was in Exeus to try out for the team. The trials were to be held in Stamford Bridge, London, in early July 1923, and the Olympics themselves were to be held in Paris exactly a year later in July 1924. Although Eric was the best sprinter in Scotland, he wasn't automatically assured of a place on the Olympic team to represent Great Britain. Great Britain was made up of England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and each of these countries had its own great athletes. The only way to secure a place on the team was to be one of the first three finishers in your event at the British Championships and Olympic Trials in Stamford Bridge. Eric did that and more. He won both heats and both finals and in the process set a new British record for the 100 yards of 9.7 seconds. This record would stand for 35 years until Peter Radford bettered it by a second. Eric finished the 220-yard race in 21.6 seconds, his best time ever over the distance. At the end of the competition, he was rewarded with the Harvey Cup for Best Athlete. Of the year and, of course, something even more important to him a place on the British Olympic team. He was entered in both the 100-meter and the 200-meter races. The Olympic Games use metric measurements to measure the distance of the various events. A meter is approximately three inches longer than a yard. After the team was announced, newspapers all over Great Britain blazed with stow rise about Britain's best hope for a gold medal in the 100-meter race. The following weekend, the newspapers were announcing even more startling news. Eric had performed a miracle. At least, that's how it had looked to the spectators at Stoke-on-Trent. Eric was representing Scotland in a competition against Ireland and England. He was entered in the 440-yard race, a distance of once around the track. Eric hardly ever ran this distance in competitions, and he was not favored to win. He drew the inside lane, the best lane for the race. As usual, before the start of the race, he shook hands with each contestant, finishing with J.J. Gillies, a runner from England. Gillies was running in the lane next to Eric. When the starter's off to a fast start. But it took only a second for Dice's turn to strike. 
J.J. Gillies, anxious to get into a good position in his lane, bumped into Eric and knocked him over the grass in the center of the track. A gasp gun cracked, both Gillies and Eric got from the spectators. Dean went Gillies managed to regain his balance and keep running, but Eric lay on the grass. The race was over. For him, or so he thought. He assumed he had been disqualified. Suddenly, though, he caught a glimpse of one of the officials waving frantically for him to get up. Apparently he was not disqualified, so he sprang to his feet and sprinted off down the track after the other runners, who were now at least 20 yards in front of him. Since such races are won by inches, it seemed impossible for Eric to be able to catch up. But somehow, Eric just got faster and faster. Soon the crowd was on its feet, roaring with excitement. Was it possible that Eric could catch up to the others? Yes. He powered past the stragglers in the race. With only 40 yards to go, he was in fourth place. He flung his head back even farther than normal and willed his legs to pump faster. His legs obeyed. As the runners headed down the home straight, Eric moved up until he was neck and neck with the leader. Then, with a superhuman burst of speed, he dashed across the finish line in first place. Eric collapsed onto the track, totally exhausted. As his coach and teammates carried him off the field on a stretcher, the crowd rose to its feet and cheered on their new champion. Eric Little's race that day has been called the greatest quarter-mile race performance of all time. Eric returned to a hero's welcome in Scotland. Once again, he had made the Scottish people proud, and his countrymen eagerly awaited the Olympic Games to see their hero win the gold medal in the 100 meters. Things didn't work out quite that way, however one morning in April 1924, Three months before the start of the Olympic Games, Eric received a list of the events he was entered in. Beside each event, the times for the heats and the finals were indicated. Beside the heats for the 100-yard sprint was one faithful word, Sunday. Eric stared at the page for a long time. Sunday. It definitely said Sunday. Eric's heat to qualify for the final would be run on a Sunday. But Eric would not run on a Sunday. There was no doubt about it in his mind. His coach and the Scottish Athletic Association already knew that he did not run races on Sundays. He never had, and he never would. Since his earliest memory, he'd been taught that Sunday was a day of rest and a day of reverence for God. All his life, Eric had honored that teaching. Sunday was God's day, and nothing, not even the promise of a gold medal, was going to sway him from that belief. Eric informed the British Olympic Committee that he couldn't run in the 100-meter sprint. The newspapers quickly blazed out the news that Eric Little had refused to compete for the gold medal in the 100 meters. Now the public, who had admired him for his running ability and his character, turned on him fiercely. Some people even called him a traitor to his country, a man unfit to represent Scotland. Eric was crushed by the cruel things people said about him, but he would not change his mind. As far as he was concerned, he would not run on Sunday and that was all there was to it. To make matters worse, the dates for the two relay heats were posted soon afterwards. Both the 4x400 meter and the 4x100 meter relays were to be run on a Sunday. True to form, Eric refused to run in them as well. The British Olympic Committee met privately with the organizers of the Games in Paris, but it seemed there was little they could do about the scheduling of events. If a contestant refused to run on one particular day, the organizers didn't see it as their problem. Eric accepted this. It was his choice, and so, too, were the consequences of it. Meanwhile, the British Olympic Committee decided to try to make the best of a bad situation. It asked Eric to consider running the 200-meter and 400-meter races even though he would not be favored to win a medal in either event. Eric agreed. The committee also stepped up its support of Harold Abrahams, the English runner who was still entered in the 100 meters. Harold was not as fast as Eric, 
but he was the best Great Britain had to offer under the circumstances. While all this was happening, other things were going on in Eric's life. Robert had graduated from medical school and had been accepted for a position as a missionary doctor serving with the London Missionary Society in China. The brothers separated, not knowing how long it would be before they would see each other again. After arriving in China, Robert wrote to Eric about the turmoil that the country was in the midst of. A fierce struggle for political power was on, and as usual, it was the peasants, farmers, and poor people who suffered the most as a result these people needed as much help as they could get. As he read the letter, Eric made a decision there and then. He decided to follow in his family's footsteps and become a missionary to China. He wasn't sure where he should go in China, so he made plans to go first to Tientsin, where he had been born and where his parents were now stationed. There he could live with his family while he got established. Quietly, without telling anyone, he rode away to the Anglo-Chinese college in Tientsin to ask if they needed the services of a science teacher or a sports coach. He knew as he posted the letter that he would have to wait several months for a reply. This was fine with him, because he had a lot to do while he waited. To allow him to attend the Olympics and still graduate on schedule, Eric's professors had let him hand in assignments ahead of time. This however, meant a lot of extra work for Eric, not to mention keeping up his training for the games. Finally, all the hard work was behind him, and Eric joined the British Olympic team for the voyage across the English Channel to Paris. On board the boat, many of the other athletes on the team privately told Eric that they admired his stand against running on Sunday. Eric appreciated their support, even if they didn't express it out loud to the press. Saturday, July 5, 1924, was a very hot day in Paris. It was also the day the 8th Olympic Games of modern times were officially opened. The Olympic Games had originated in Athens, Greece, in 776 BC to honor the 12 gods, especially Zeus, the most powerful of them all, who, according to myth, lived on Mount Olympus. The games were held every four years and consisted of a day of running races and wrestling matches. Eventually, in AD 393, they were banned by Roman Emperor Theodosius. At the end of the 19th century, a Frenchman, Baron Pierre de Courbetin, made it his mission to bring back the Olympic Games. This time, every country in the world would be invited to send contestants, and many sports would be played. The idea caught on, and in 1896, the first of the modern Olympic Games was opened in Athens. The Games had been held every four years since then, except for 1916, when they were cancelled because of World War I. Over the years, several changes were made to the Games. The 1912 Olympic Games in Stockholm, Sweden, were the first to allow women to compete, and the 1924 Paris Olympics were the first to include winter sports. Of course, the winter events were not held in the sweltering summer heat of Paris. They were held in the French Alps at Germanix. Each country also had its own rules about entering the Games. The United States poured a lot of money into helping its contestants. The U.S. government hired an ocean liner, the USS America, to take the U.S. team to the Olympics. The ship had a special 200-meter cork track installed on board so that the athletes could continue their training. Once in Paris, the American team had the best accommodations and plenty of money to pay twice or even three times the going rate for a taxi. Because of this, the other teams often found it difficult to get a taxi to take them to Columbia Stadium where the games were being held. If they weren't Americans, the taxi drivers didn't seem interested in taking them. Many of the other contestants often had to resort to flagging down private cars and begging for a ride to the stadium to compete in their event. 1924 was also the first year the British government helped its competitors pay for their travel and accommodations. Until this time, each competitor had paid all his or her own expenses to compete in the games. It was a good thing that the British government had decided to change this, 
because Eric would never have been able to come up with the money necessary to cover his expenses. During the opening ceremony, Eric marched proudly into Colombi Stadium with the rest of the British team. The Union Jack fluttered lightly over them. The team was dressed in blue and white, the women with white skirts and blue blazers and the men with white pants and the same blue blazers. The men also wore white straw hats. The drone of bagpipes played by the King's own pipers filled the air as the athletes marched in. Each male member of the team took off his hat as a sign of respect as the team passed the podium where the French president and Baron Pierre de Courbetin stood watching. One by one the rest of the teams marched into the station dial until all 45 teams were lined up side by side in the center of the field. Some teams were huge. The U.S. team alone had over 400 competitors. On the other hand, China had sent only two athletes, and Haiti won. The lone Haitian had to carry his own flag as well as be the entire team. As the hot afternoon sun beat down, the opening ceremony began. Baron Pierre de Courbetin declared the games open, cannons boomed, thousands of pigeons were released, and the Olympic flag was hoisted into the hot, stagnant air. The 60,000 spectators cheered. The 1924 Olympic Games had officially begun. As the teams were about to march out of the station diam, Lord Cadogan, head of the British Olympic Committee, strolled over to the British team and wished the members all luck. As he moved among the team members shaking their hands, he stopped right in front of Eric and in a loud voice declared, to play the game is the only thing in life that matters. Lord Cadogan looked directly at Eric as he spoke, and Eric got the point. Eric Little had thrown away a gold medal for Britain, and there were many who would never forgive him for it. As a result, Eric left the stadium that day a little less excited than when he'd arrived. But he still marched out with his head held high. No one, not even an English nobleman, could tell him a game was the most important thing in his life. It wasn't. Eric didn't care what people thought of his decision. Yet he was also determined to do his best in the races he was entered in and would wait and see what the outcome was. The outcome would be worth every bit of effort he had put forth. Bye-bye to be continued.